Hi everyone, good to, uh, good to see you here. Thank you for coming to the presentation. Appreciate your interest in what we're working on. I'm gonna kind of uh, just jump into it. I, I think it's gonna be useful for us to, to think about and understand what the fundamental um, value is of, of what we're doing. In my eyes, one way to look at it is that um, the conflict of interest problem has been something that the global fi financial system has had um, as a part of it for a very long time. So as you know, the financial system, whether it's the domestic one or the globally connected one, powers the global economy, the local economy, businesses, capitalism, and all of these things. So at the end of the day, um, the way the financial system works really de determines a lot of the quality of life we have and what happens in our lives and in the larger world. This conflict of interest problem is one that has existed for hundreds of years. Many more years uh, than even people like Adam Smith were talking about it in Wealth of Nations and then more modern economists like Milton Friedman. But really, um, I think this problem is at the core uh, of why things fail and why there's cyclical boom and bust cycles that basically take society for a ride and leave um, us paying for it. The two forms that this really takes um, in the modern world is data and market manipulation and over leveraging. And once again, my strong belief is that if we can make the financial system work properly, then we can have a much better world, both domestically and on a global level. So the first version of this problem is this data manipulation, market manipulation problem, which really, thanks to technology and globalization, is only accelerating in size and scope. So if before market crashes happened locally and they were small, now market crashes happen globally and they are large. And they affect very, very large pieces of the population. This data manipulation market failure problem is basically created by people who are extremely driven by the profit motive, um, which is fine. What's not fine is that they basically make society pay for it. Enron is a good example. The LIBOR scandal, uh, which affected $300 trillion in assets and had over $10 billion in fines, is another example. And other recent examples are where traders, hedge funds, market makers, people gathered around places like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and others, basically manipulate commodity and forex prices, which actually affect all of us because commodity and forex prices determine what the goods we consume cost and what we pay for those goods. So the first problem is essentially a market manipulation problem that's really often a data manipulation problem because markets are driven by data. The second version of this conflict of interest problem is over leveraging. Over leveraging is basically bad risk management that's allowed by the system and then it goes to a degree that causes systemic large scale failure, which once again, society, AKA we pay for. One good example is the 2008 financial crisis. Um, since then, the examples um, maybe have gotten a little bit smaller, but they still continue, and I think we're actually going towards quite a big one again. Um, Archegos is a good example where one guy was able to take billions from banks and actually closed, closed, as, closed down a few of his counterparties' entire departments that traded with him. So one guy was able to do that because he got so leveraged. Um, and then other more recent examples that you're more familiar with are things like SVB, which is once again a risk management problem. So this second conflict of interest basically allows people to gamble to an excessive degree. And then, as you know, we pay. Not them, we. Um, this model uh, has persisted for many years because it isn't possible to make it impossible. But now it is. So that's really what, what, what we work on. We work on creating infrastructure that is tamper-proof and conflict of interest free. So the key idea here is not just that the infrastructure is fast or secure or reliable, which it is, it's also that it removes conflict of interest, not by virtue of the legal system or by virtue of asking very nicely or by virtue of making it socially unacceptable, but by virtue of it being not possible. Basically making it so that people who want to manipulate the system to steal money from initially end users of the system, but eventually they steal so much money that it creates a kind of 
semi-societal collapse mode, um, FTX Alameda is a good example, right? All sounds very logical. There's FTX, there's Alameda. Oh no, <laughs> there's FTX and Alameda. We're like this close to large scale blockchain crypto collapse, right? So that's uh, what, what I'm talking about when I say conflict of interest. So the first thing that we did when we created Oracle Networks was we the, solved this data and market manipulation issue by providing data that was truly reliable and able to be resistant to manip manipulation and resisted this conflict of interest problem. Even if you were a very big actor with a lot of money, even if you're a market maker or a hedge fund, you cannot go and manipulate um, the Chainlink data source in order to steal and extract value from DeFi. And this is why DeFi is an alternative to that other world that I just explained where that happens on a regular basis and then it happens so much that there's a nice big scandal and everybody loses faith in the system. So the, the thing that we have is not the ability to recreate the existing financial system in a little small form where the same people get to steal money from a slightly different group of people. That's not very interesting to me. I'm not interested in spending the next 10 years doing that. I'm, I'm much more interested in there's an alternative financial system where nobody can steal from anyone else. And then when those people continue to steal in the traditional financial system, and it becomes obvious that they are, and they, they are, um, then everyone will migrate to this conflict of interest free alternative. So that's what we're building. That's what I think most of you are building. And, and that's what I, I think this is all about. The, the, the second example is proof of reserves. Uh, proof of reserves is a very good, very focused example. It's actually a relatively simple product because it uses an Oracle network to basically prove the balance sheet or the assets of a counterparty, an institution, or whatever is backing a stable coin or a commodity coin. But proof of reserves, as an example, was not so important or critical or, or valuable before FTX, right? After FTX, proof of reserves became an obvious solution for eliminating the conflict of interest that allows someone to manipulate a balance sheet to basically take your money. And even if they didn't take your money, they screwed all of us because now we have to explain to everybody why we are not FTX or Alameda. We have to justify this for months and years to gain back the trust of institutions and users to grow our industry. So even if they didn't take your money, you don't want this to happen. What you want, I think, in my opinion, or more importantly, not importantly, but more accurately, what I want is a conflict of interest free alternative financial system. And from our point of view, we've started doing that by providing market data, which is the most common attack vector. Then we've provided uh, solvency, uh, not solvency, asset proof and balance sheet proof data through proof of reserves. And so far, we have been able to successfully combat manipulation. So flash loans attack don't work on Chainlink Oracle networks. Direct attacks so far haven't worked. And other types of attacks haven't worked either. So great news. We're on the way there, and DeFi grew to as much as a $200 billion industry with our help. So far, the system has processed over $7 trillion in transaction value. So there's definitely transactional throughput that wants to transact in this conflict of interest free manner. That's basically DeFi. That's what drives this large number. In my expectation, that number will go much, much higher. So it's been over 7.7 .7 trillion in transactional value. Um, it's grown to over 200 billion in um, DeFi as a whole. And independent third parties have done on-chain analysis to show that the data that we put on chain, which is, which is manipulation and co conflict of interest free, manipulation resistant and conflict of interest free, actually is the driver for DeFi, right? Because once again, you, you cannot build a tamper-proof, conflict of interest free system if the data controlling that system or the automation controlling that system or even the cross-chain method controlling that system can be manipulated by someone. When you can manipulate one of the methods controlling the system, you can manipulate the system and your whole tamper-proof, conflict of interest free value proposition goes up in smoke and everything becomes another market maker, hedge fund trader, manipulation Disneyland that, that makes money for them, but leaves us with the bill. So 
Um, that's what you know, we've been able to do so far. Proof of reserves is also doing extremely well. As you can see, this thing is going almost vertical for a very similar reason. Hey, FTX, OK, Alameda, yeah, I heard of it, big deal. <laughs> Two weeks later, oh no, my god, FTX, Alameda, what a nightmare. Proof of reserves, we need it, we got to have it. Conflict of interest, what a problem, so on and so on. That's, um, that's the recurring story, OK? It's going to be the recurring story. Frankly, those of you building protocols that can just see a step or two ahead in the story and build a protocol that's resistant to the next stream of attacks will have a very good protocol because people that don't make themselves resistant to the next stream of attacks will have their money taken, whereas your protocol won't, and so you'll do better. And, and our job is to give you the infrastructure to build that better protocol so that when the few people that try to replicate the FTX Alameda con in a DeFi format get found out, you wonderful people who build the alternative have a system that can reliably resist that type of manipulation, and our industry has a leg to stand on. So while we started with data, and the vast majority of, of all this um, value that I showed you, the 7.7 .7 plus trillion, is really just from market data and proof of reserves. There is actually a whole other category of things, such as computation and cross-chain communications, that can control these protocols as well. So basically, we're building the entire suite, the entire decentralized stack of tools and systems that developers need to build a conflict of interest resistant protocol. So a protocol that no matter how big the participants are, they cannot co-opt it to trade against smaller participants. They cannot manipulate it. You, you cannot have an Enron in the system, basically. You cannot have somebody who can turn this into their market maker, trader hedge fund, manipulation Disneyland, which is what a lot of the existing financial system is, which, once again, is something I'm not interested in. I'm very interested in building that alternative. And I actually very strongly believe that the global capital markets are extremely interested in that alternative as well, because the majority of, of these banking folks just want to take their clients' money, make some percentage off of it, and store it securely and reliably somewhere where they get to get a percentage. Some of them want to do wacky stuff. Many of them don't. So if we can build a tamper-proof, conflict of interest-free financial system, then the crypto thing and the traditional markets thing will just be one thing. That's what they'll be. Because you would never, no real market participant, the one that isn't trying to steal from everyone else and leave everyone else with the bill, no one wants a less reliable market. They don't want that. So the world we're trying to build is the one where there's many different uh, contracts, by all means, on many different chains, have fun, enjoy. Um, but at, at the end of the day, they're connected in a secure, reliable way, so there's no attack vector in manipulating the connection. The data driving the markets is reliable and conflict, uh, in, uh, conflict of interest free and tamper proof. And the automation and some of the key computations are also resistant. So it's not just about making a blockchain, then a lot more blockchains, and putting things in blockchains. It's about making sure that the things that the contract in the blockchain relies on also meets this very high standard. And if, if we continue to do this, we will have a nice architecture like this. And this nice architecture will be the future of the entire global financial system. And it'll actually create nice local domestic financial systems in places where they don't even have a legal system. So it'll, it, it'll, be, it'll be simply wonderful. And I'm very, very excited to get there. But in order for us to get there, we, we need to do a couple of things. We, we need developers to keep building great applications. We need um, users to become educated about the security dynamics that they're engaging in and ask for greater security and greater reliability and lack of conflict uh, of interest and conflict of interest-free inputs. And we need it to be built securely so money isn't lost. So, so if we can do these things and we can avoid replicating the FTX Alameda 
oh my God, it's so obvious, but it wasn't obvious two weeks ago situation um, within DeFi, then we can be the way the world works. And that's who we can be if we do all that. Now, one of the things we need to do in order to arrive there is actually protect this um, architecture from um, various attack vectors. The attack vectors um, that initially have start, uh, started out years ago that Chainlink has been resistant to have been things like directly trying to attack Oracle networks on chain or off chain. And Oracle networks, at least in Chainlink's case, have so far resisted those attacks. Then the next attacks that happened were something called flash loan attacks, which we talked about a few years before they became a real problem. And sure enough, they became a real problem. And basically, a flash loan attack is about manipulating data. So you go to the data source, you manipulate the data source. The data source's input is uh, under the control of essentially some market maker trader hedge fund guy. The market maker trader hedge fund guy steals the money. And then the protocol dies, and everyone else loses their money. Right? So that's what flash loans were. Luckily for us and for our users, uh, Chainlink networks have resisted flash loans. Uh, I am seeing more and more various attack vectors popping up because I think people are realizing that if you can't crack the contract, you want to crack the systems that control the contract, the systems that create valuable inputs and valu valuable connections between the contracts, namely Oracle networks. One of the attacks that I've uh, re recently, started to, uh, recently started to witness and see start happening is uh, what I'm calling the wolf in sheep's clothing attack. So basically, you have a few people who are making oracles now, and they're saying, I'm a nice, reliable oracle. You can trust me. Um, but really, they are wholly owned by a trading firm or a hedge fund, or maybe they're just a private trader themselves. And then what they're doing is they're going out. They are presenting this oracle and saying, hey, I'm a nice, reliable oracle. Please let me completely control your market. I'm nothing like the FTX Alameda scam, nothing like that here. I'm such a nice guy. But then it turns out that the nice guy um, is a psychopath who only wants to steal money from the protocol. So this is actually how commodity traders um, do this in larger markets. They've done it in various commodity trading settings and various Forex settings. Um, and they continue to do it today, and there's many, many cases of it. There's other attack vectors where people are more actively trying to exploit flash loans, gain access to data, so on and so on. But as the value continues to rise, we will see these attacks increase. As these attacks increase, what's important is that users understand the attacks and make sure that the protocols that they're using are actually conflict of interest free. Because the more money you put into a protocol, that some psychopath, hedge fund, market maker, trader can steal from, the harder that um, protocol might fail, which will be bad for all of us, plus the more money you would lose, which, I don't know, it's your money. Um, we actually have to be educated about private key security, about the inputs into the system, and also about how those inputs are created in order to demand that the systems that get built aren't these replicas of the traditional financial system that make a few people rich, but make the rest of us have to explain why we replicated the FTX Alameda thing within our industry. Which once again, I won't have to explain because we're not doing that. We have no plans and no systems and no way to, to go and trade against anybody. Um, but it's just something to, to keep in mind that this is the architecture that we have to protect and that everybody has to be informed about and make sure that the systems they're putting their money into are actually run in a way where no third party can go trade against them and steal their money. And that'll actually make, make the whole ecosystem better. And once again, if we do this, we have this great um, outcome where we would be able to be the alternative. So, so how do we really go from this world where you have one and a half to two trillion dollars in crypto value? I mean, is it really that we replicate the existing financial system to shave the same sheep a different way? 
Is that really how we're going to get to an industry with hundreds of trillions of dollars in it? I don't think so. I don't actually want to do that. Um, the only way we're going to get to a world where there's hundreds of trillions of dollars in our industry is that when all the sheep over there get shaved and they realize it, and there's another LIBOR or another SVB or another Enron or another whatever, we are the, we are the reliable, real, conflict of interest free alternative. And then once again, we will become how the world works because it's better. So there's actually quite a bit at stake here between if we replicate the existing financial system where people with certain advantages and certain predatory instincts are able to lie to us and trick us and through our work and through our protocols steal from users, make money, get caught, and then we have to explain to everybody why, no, 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 it was just one, one thing, it wasn't, it wasn't us, right? It, we're not FTX, they're FTX. Or we could be smarter, we could avoid that, we could build an alternative that actually creates an alternative to conflicts of interest and really build something extremely useful and important for how the world changes. If you haven't guessed, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, we're doing two other things to make this possible in addition to creating the technology. We are creating a very sustainable and incentive aligned infrastructure that basically makes more money and, and creates more revenue into the system to pay for more security as the various protocols that get powered by it continue to succeed and make more fees. So our econo economic system is not powered by giving away data, pretending to be something we're not, and then trading against people and stealing their money, and then being caught, and then having everyone else explain why DeFi is actually not that thing. Our system is to provide you conflict of interest free infrastructure, and to create an incentive aligned relationship so that as the protocol that uses that infrastructure secures more, it has to pay more because it has to buy more security, and that the security scales with the protocol. And the incentives are aligned in a way that doesn't create conflicts of interest. And there is no conflict of interest, there's just a sustainable, reliable infrastructure. This is being done through the build program for dApps and protocols uh, very successfully. Since the last time I talked about it, I think that program tripled in the amount of participants and is growing quite rapidly. For blockchains and ecosystems, it's the scale program. And uh, most recently, we had a very good development with GMX. I think at the moment, the, lar at the, moment, the largest derivatives protocol, basically passing a com community vote with over 96% support to utilize um, chain link data to power their markets for the reasons that I told you that there is now a conflict of interest free alternative to generating um, that type of market. And I think that people who continue to do that will build the protocols that are the alternatives to broken markets in the traditional financial world and to the few people in this world that decide to replicate the FTX Alameda relationship in DeFi, which once again, I think is a really bad idea. And what we all want to do is put our money and put our attention into building something that isn't run in this manipulated way. The final thing that we're doing, in addition to providing the technology and creating proper incentive alignment without conflicts of interest, is we're generating an interface for capital markets and banks to properly interact with um, blockchains very efficiently. So my very strong belief is that as long as we can keep the technology conflict of interest free, secure and hyper reliable, and we can continue to grow it in a sustainable, economically justifiable way so that the costs expended by it grow with the, the security it provides and, and that it continues to provide security at larger and larger scale. Capital markets participants, namely banks that have trillions of dollars, will continue to use it more and more. We've already seen people make stable coins um, from banks. Large banks actually create their own stable coins and put them onto chains. And we've seen more and more of them uh, start to talk with us about building more advanced applications. 
We are working with um, an increasingly larger amount of banks. And some of the things I'm seeing there suggest to me that things will move beyond a proof of concept into a pilot and into production. And just to be clear on what it moving into production means, banks have trillions of dollars. So if our industry is going to grow, yes, it can grow from you know, prop traders, institutions, and whoever wanting to use it. But it, um, it really does need large institutions to decide to become part of it because it's a superior system. And for us to do that, we need to, for that, that to happen, we need it to be a superior system. So the final thing that we're doing is working with large capital markets institutions to enable them to access these conflict of interest free, reliable, and tamper proof alternatives and offer them to their clients um, in large volume and in a very usable way. So I really appreciate everyone's attention. Um, I think we have another part of the session that I don't want to monopolize, so I don't want to monopolize the time too much. But um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, please be aware of the security guarantees of the protocols that you're using. Please be aware of how they're secured. Please be aware of where the data is coming from. And uh, please be aware of how, how that system is working. Because um, at the end of the day, your decisions about what systems to use will also inform how this industry evolves. I'm very excited to build it together with all of you. And thank you uh, for your attention during, uh, during this talk.